Have you ever wondered, what is an inductive Bible study anyway? That's what we're going to talk about today. The Bible shows the way to go to heaven, not the way the heavens go. Galileo Galilei. Today we're going to start off our conversation, but still looking at how to study the Bible. We're looking at it through the book called Inductive Bible Study, Observations, Interpretations, and Applications Through the Lenses of History, Literature, and Theology by Richard Allen Fuhrer Jr. and Andreas Kosenberger. I've always been interested in this phrase, the inductive Bible study. I used to work for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, which is heavily involved in all kinds of Bible studies. And I was a brand new Christian at the time, so I wasn't exactly sure what people meant when they talked about the different kinds of Bible studies. I knew people were doing different kinds of Bible studies, but the one I heard most often was the inductive Bible study. What does that even mean? So I thought you might enjoy doing a deep dive into one of the most popular ways people study the Bible. And they admit up front, the Bible is not an easy book to study, primarily because it's not a book to study. It is 66 books to study. Quote, in its pages, we are confronted with a history that is not our own, cultural norms that are often different from our contemporary practices, literature that communicates through a complex array of genres and subgenres, and theology that defies simplistic categorization. He's right. It is hard to, to do it all when studying the Bible. I think what will make it easier for you, and it makes it easier for me, is that don't look at it as, I'm going to study the Bible which is exactly what I'm doing in my podcast, right? Instead, I'm going to study this chapter, and then I'm going to study the next chapter, and I'm going to tie those chapters together, and then I'm going to tie this book together, and then I'm going to tie these categories of books together. Don't make it into this big thing like he just said, because it sounds very intimidating. You know what I say to do? Use small steps. Did, did you see that coming? Use small steps to study the Bible, and I think it will be easier. Because I still fundamentally believe that the Bible was written by all these different authors. Most of them had jobs. Most of them weren't kings or queens. There were a few in there, David and Solomon. Most of them didn't have a formal education. They weren't trying to write for philosophy majors. They were mostly common people writing for extraordinary times. Understand what he's saying. And I agree with what he's saying in that sentence. But I also think it can be done. This experiment, can a normal layperson read the Bible and maybe not get every bip and bop from it, although every bip and bop is important, do a pretty darn good job. And then when you don't understand a bip and a bop, you go talk to someone, you go ask your pastor, you go ask someone who knows more than you do. It is totally doable. So I don't want you to be scared away by that. He goes on to scare more people away from that by also indicating that you're going to get different interpretations because there are people with different field, Hebrew experts and history experts and people who understand from PhDs ancient writings. But also a five-year-old can understand the basic message of the gospel and be saved. It is that easy to read and understand the main points of it. You will get it and you will understand it. And so he talks about how can we now go from this idea, use the tools we have in contemporary time in a book that was written in ancient times? I'm going to tell you right out from here, the best way I found is using Logo software. With Logo software, and I'm not like a thing for them or anything like that, but that's how I'm doing this podcast because I can highlight a passage and then it will tell me in the opinions of 43 other people what that passage means or what this word means, or what does it sound like in Greek, or is it talking to one pe person, or is it talking to 47 people? It helps just having that kind of power of software right in front of you. But you know what? You want to sit on your couch next to a lit candle and read the scripture? That works too. He says that throughout the course of this book, we're going to talk about what it is to study the Bible and how we can get there using real life tools, not like my Logos Bible software tool, but what can we do? He says it's like building a shed in your backyard. That's his analogy. The most important thing is to understand the cost, get the right tools in place, get the proper supplies, follow instructions, and know what you're going to build, right? If you just sort of decide, I'm going to build a shed and you don't know what you're doing. And I have tried to do that before. 
it goes terribly wrong. So we're going to go about this in a systematic way, and that's really what the inductive Bible study is about. And he says that we have some challenges to overcome. First of all, it was a long time ago. (laughs) Most of these stories are a long time ago. And then he says there's also a geographical gap, which means that it's a different part of the world than where most of us are used to being in. And then there's a cultural gap. There was a culture in that society at that time in this part of the world we're just not living in. And so it makes it harder to understand. And he says that if we could go in the time machine and bring our Bible with us, then we would have a truer sense of what was going on. But I also feel now that I've been doing the Bible in small steps. So I read the book so I could figure out what I'm going to do. Now I'm reading the book and it's interesting because I have a little bit of a different point of view than when I read it before I started the podcast. Because even though We have these gaps of time, culture, and geography. You know what? People are kind of just people. It's so funny because they hate paying taxes. They're worried about how they're going to feed their family. They're worried about turmoil in their society. They just want consistency. They want hope. They want camaraderie with their neighbors. They want to avoid war and have friends. And I don't want to make it simple like this, but when I read these people, that I've done so far in the podcast, I get them. I understand them. Maybe not every, again, bip and bop because they lived at a different time, place, and culture. But I understand them. I know what it's like to see a guy who's studying the Bible his whole life. And now this one guy tells him, you know, everything you've been studying your whole time, you're wrong and you're interpreting it wrong and you need to rethink yourself. I know that bold guy like Peter who blurts out the thing you shouldn't blurt out, who thinks, no, oh, this is going to be easy. We're going to be able to get through this together. I would never deny you and finds out life's a little harder than he thought it was. I know people who think when something good happens in their life, I'm going to sit on the left and the right of this great leader of this company and find out they can't. They're not even nearly qualified to do that. I know women who are faithful to people, to their husbands, to their families, when no one else is. You understand these people. It is not quite so bad. (laughs) So I just want to give you heart that this can be done. Or Jeremiah, who cried about the sins of his people. He felt the needs of his people and the way that they were treating things so deeply, it affected him to tears. You get that kind of person. You understand people who feel that deeply. And it talks about you had that time machine. You'd be able to travel to places. You would be able to see what the world looked like. You would be able to see the Dead Sea is so low. He says it's more severe than the height between Denver and ski country. And he said that many people would find out that the Sea of Galilee is lower in elevation than Death Valley itself. You would be able to see kings and armies and soldiers and and see what was going on, seeing how hard it was to travel. I think it's always very interesting when we look at the story of Joseph and Mary. So they hiked it over to Bethlehem to go register for the... You don't realize how treacherous travel was, particularly for a pregnant woman. This was a big deal. So I get what he means and I get his gaps, but, you know, I understand about that. He goes on to say there's a language gap, too, that, you know, the Bible's written in Hebrew, an ancient, ancient language. I believe the first language. Also in Koine Greek, which is a very, from what I understand, basic form of Greek. And Aramaic, which is a language that's like Hebrew, but sort of went through some evolution in the terms of a language. He says there's a literary gap where we may not understand all the literary terms, the language terms, the way that people wrote now until then. He he also says, interestingly enough, there's a supernatural gap. And I get that too, because we live in a world where we don't experience those things. Now, a lot of people tend to believe that the healings of the apostles were the healings and the miracles of the apostles. And that when the apostles were gone, those acts were gone as well. That we now have 
the Bible in writing as our miracle that we can translate, we can transmit, we can carry around with us. I have one on my iPhone. I have one on my iPad. I have 107 different Bibles around this house and half of them are digital. So we don't experience miracles in that same spectacular way, but we experience miracles in a different way now. He says there's a theological gap because God at that time was releasing himself. He was showing himself to people over time and the various covenants that he gave to Abraham, he gave to Moses, he gave to Noah. And then Jesus did at the Last Supper was an evolution of a thought that we just don't get to see quite the same way just because it happened so long ago. It's not so much even culture or time in that same way, but parts of the Bible lived in an era where people sacrificed to God. They took something that was precious to them that would determine whether they would live another season and their families would thrive in this land and gave it to God first. We don't live in a time of sacrifice like that. Or people lived in a time where tribes went to war over certain plots of land. And of course, we have war, but our wars, I think, are much more serious. And I'm not saying that war wasn't serious then, but we have a different viewpoint on it because tribes went to fight all the time. So this is where then it comes in. How can we get through these gaps and start interpreting and reading the Bible for everything that is going to make a difference in our lives to help us be students, he says, of the Bible so that we understand the word of God. And even with our brains and our time period, and we're going to have different struggles than the people at that time had. Every generation has its own kind of struggle. I think we struggle with wealth. We are very wealthy. Almost every person in the Western world compared to the people at that time are very wealthy. And so we struggle with issues of wealth more than I think they did. To find someone, I think, who has as much as we have, you would be looking at kings and queens, not at common people. And we have more now of people who would classify by their standards as kings and queens right now. He says that hermeneutics is a, what they call the science and art of Bible interpretation. I don't know what possessed me, but when I was an atheist, I took a class called the hermeneutics of the Bible. It was a graduate level course. I took it like when I was a sophomore. This was way over my head. I was so sorry I took the class. And most of the grad students took pity on me and they helped me out in the class. But wow, that was something. But it, it's meant to be kind of like a science of studying the Bible. And there's different ways of going about it. And he says that part of it is a skill, part of it is an art. But interpreting the Bible is something that we're going to try to do in a methodical way so that we understand what's going on in the Bible. So far, this maybe isn't quite the art you had in mind. But he says that when you do this, you're going to look at different principles of studying the Bible. One is the literal principle. What does it say at face value? Don't read into the text. Don't try to couch the text. Don't try to enhance the text. Just read it for exactly what it says. The next part is the contextual principle, which means to understand the text within the confines, it says, of history, literature, and theology. What does it mean in context? He next goes on to say there's something called the one meaning principle, which means that if you look at a text and correctly interpret it, it will normally have one interpretation that is correct, even though there may be multiple applications to it. Jesus talks to the rich ruler and tells him to sell everything he has. There's one interpretation of what is going on here, but we may get many lessons from it, I think is what he's going for. So then there's the exegetical principle, I hope I'm saying that right, which means we must draw the meaning from what was actually written down instead of deciding what the text means and applying it that way. The linguistic principle, which is the language. What was the original language? What were the meanings of the actual words? The progressive principle, which means is there later revelation in the Bible that explains 
the earlier part of it. Part of the reason I wanted to do the Bible in small steps, and the, it was this particular part, is I wanted to do the New Testament first. I wanted us to get a solid grip on the ministry of Jesus, the early church, and the letters. Then go back and look at the Old Testament so that it would help us explain what was happening and what was the meaning behind things. It was, believe it or not, it was just this one little sentence that said, something later in the Bible comes back to explain something earlier. And then the harmony principle. He says that any bit of the Bible can have multiple meanings, which harmonizes with a doctrine of the Bible. There's a continuity between all of the chapters, all of the books, everything. And so you want to look at how this particular piece you're looking at it harmonizes with the rest of the story. All right. So then he goes on in this book, and I will tell you that this book is very interesting. He get, then goes into each of these, trying to help you understand what that means. What does it mean to do the literal face value? What does it mean to go on and look at something in context? Where you're looking at the background, he says the human drama of history, the cultural meaning, the theological context, what is happening? What happened right before it? What happened right after it? And putting it in context. He helps people do that in the story of this book. And then, like I said, when I got to the little subsection about the progressive principle, that you realize God's word progresses over time and through revelation. And that we understand God's word when we see it all together in context. We understand the Old Testament better because now we see the New Testament. And this one little chapter is what made me put the Bible in the order that I did. So then he says there's two different kinds of ways of looking at the Bible then is inductive, which means it's going to be evidence-based, and then deductive, which means that we're going to begin with certain assumptions, beliefs, and then give the Bible room, it says, to support or deny those particular beliefs. Inductive is going to be that you're going to come into this and say, I'm just going to read it for what it is. And you can tell right there. That's where I saw that. And I'm like, that's the type of Bible study I'm going to do in this podcast. I don't have a horse to sell you in that podcast. I have my own opinions. I have my own denomination. But I want to just read it with fresh eyes. And you might notice that sometimes I will say something and you might think to yourself, did Jill ever read the Bible? I mean, she shouldn't have known this, right? Like 20 years ago. Because I'm trying to take a fresh approach to it as if I almost never read it before. Wow, that's a cool statement. Because I wanted that interpretation not to be predetermined by me, but let it open my eyes to something. So I'm going to look at the evidence of what was said. And so you might hear me say something like that, and I'm not saying I'm doing it right. I'm just a human person girl who's trying to get through the Bible with the knowledge that I have and the resources I have. But I'll say, boy, you know, it sounded to me like there was a lot of doubt in that sentence. I may have read that 30 times in the past, but now that I read it again, I'm interested in that fresh take. We're going to read it as the author intended. We're not going to try to apply additional meetings to it. We're going to try to give every evidence we can based on culture, history, timing, where it was in the Bible, who said it, who did they say it to, and learn, discover together what this Bible means. While, like I said, deductive is more the approach that we're going to decide what it means, and then we're going to look for those meanings in there. I, I was not interested in doing that kind of Bible study. And he says that the good part about inductive Bible studies is that you realize that you're not going to bring in your prior conclusions. I think that's good. The other thing is that you are going to come up with ideas that are probable and not absolutes. When Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, and he's saying it, at the direction of Peter. Does he say that pa- Peter is Satan? Is he saying that Peter is taking language and words from Satan and repeating them? Or did Jesus suddenly detect the presence of Satan in that room, whispering in Peter's ear? I don't know. I still don't know, but I have some ideas about it. But we think about them as probables, not as absolutes. And he said that really we have to know that the Bible is meant to be understood. It is meant from God for us to understand. 
so that we understand how our salvation takes place. Like he said, a five-year-old could read it and understand what makes a difference in salvation. But we can spend a lifetime learning more, understanding more, and getting into those deep details we never could. I'll tell you, even in my own Bible study, I try to look up certain key words. What was the actual Greek meaning of it? And to be honest with you, I do it because one of the commentaries will say, oh, this Greek word is pretty unique. Okay, so then I go back and I look at the Greek word to see what it actually says. There are people who will do a word-by-word Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic Bible study. I am not doing that. But if you did it, I bet you would learn a lot of different things. So it is one of those things that you will be able to understand the Bible right away, take a lifetime of really getting everything. So my challenge to you is try again with another very small book, maybe an epistle that you can go ahead and start seeing how the inductive versus deductive Bible study works. If you've read something that you've read a million times before, maybe you've read Hosea a hundred times and you think you know what it means, or you've read the, the first Peter before and you think you understand exactly what's going on there, try it with that deductive lens and then the inductive lens. See how it kind of leads you in different places. Whether you read it going in with a deduction or you read it with a fresh pair of eyes. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. If you have anything to say to me, if you got a Bible study together and you're, I'm curious to know how it's going, or is there a topic or a book you would love for me to cover? And remember, us studying the Bible in a logical method starts with small steps. <laughs>